Um, if you have your Bibles and if you're a student and you don't have access to a Bible now, that's a problem. Um, so whether it's uh, paper or electronic, uh, let's go Acts 28. Um, I want to teach one thing uh, fairly quickly. I want to ask one significant question and, uh, and then kind of open it up for uh, Q&A. So um, Acts 28, I want to read right, uh, really beginning in verse 30 and 31 and, uh, and start there. So... This is talking about the Apostle Paul and says this, that he, Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, verse 31, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Right? Now, what's the next verse? Y'all going to have to talk to me now. Next verse is... Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Here's the lesson. There is no Acts 29 in the Bible. So um, working for an organization called Acts 29, uh, we get asked. Sometimes people are wondering if we've kind of lost uh, our bearings in calling it Acts 29. We messed up somehow, even though the organization's been around almost 15 years. And, and we say look, the, the reason it's called Acts 29 is because when you look at verse 31 and this emphasis on proclaiming the kingdom of God, teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, without hindrance, Acts 29 is just simply saying we want to keep doing that. That's what we want to be about. You know, we want to be about resourcing church planners and church planning pastors, church planning churches uh, by recruiting, assessing, training, and supporting people that are in those works for the advancement of the kingdom of God. That's why we do what we do. And so uh, a, a quick version of my story. I'm a 97 graduate of Samford uh, with an accounting degree and uh, came to Beeson um, honestly because there was a very attractive 80 pie at Samford who had one more year left and I wasn't letting her out of my sights. And so Beeson was right here. Um, I did feel like God was calling me to some kind of vocational professional ministry. I didn't know what that was going to look like. And so I started coming here to class with no developed theology, uh, nothing other than the fact that Jesus had done a work in my life, and, and I felt like he had called me to help people follow him. So I stayed. Uh, we ended up getting married. We've been married 15 years. And, uh, and, and my time at Beeson was phenomenal in, in hindsight, and here's why. Um, I, I think, well, I know, I didn't appreciate what I was experiencing when I was here. Uh, I think it was really easy for me to go, well, this is just the next thing. Uh, I need to be in professional vocational ministry, so I needed to come here. And so I came here, took my classes, uh, skipped every single one of Dr. Bray's classes. Why? Because he didn't take attendance. I just had to write papers, and I didn't go to class. Now, I was doing campus ministry at the time as well, and so I had, I had all kinds of students that were over here in Sanford's food court, and so I wasn't just going up and playing video games. I was going and doing that. But there was some element of missed opportunity that in hindsight, there was, a, there was way too much arrogance and hubris uh, that I couldn't recognize at the time. And if you had called me that, we, we would have gone out in the parking lot and had a discussion. So I, I left Beeson, went on staff at a local church for three years, moved to Athens and, and, and replanted a church there nine years ago, and it's where I've been. We got into Acts 29 because we were trying to figure out how to build and develop our church. And, uh, and just kind of followed some footnotes and uh, ended up talking to Acts 29, kind of asking if they could help us rebuild our church. And so we've been in the network for almost six years. And uh, along the way, I became the Georgia Regional Director and then the Southeast Regional Director, which means I had the responsibility for helping build and develop local networks of churches that were starting churches. And, uh, and then as Betsy said, I, I've been the Director of Operations since May and uh, that basically means I'm the janitor. I fix stuff, and uh, that's my responsibility: is to look at what we're doing globally and make sure we're we're running our plays and doing the things we're supposed to do to help our men grow their church networks and develop their churches. So that's the short version on me. Here's the big question that I want to ask you: um, as you're processing this, am I supposed to be involved in church planting? That's the question am I supposed to be involved in church planting? And I think it opens up several questions underneath that that I think you need to wrestle with. Uh, the first thing comes out of just am I? And, and I would just, I would ask you, do you know who you are? 
I think there's a significant amount that when we're working with men in the recruiting and assessment process of church planting, when we're talking to people, we're talking to families about being involved in church plants, there's some element of identity. And I think one of the things that an environment like this does, being in a community like this, um, it, it, I came here to build my identity. I didn't know it at the time. I had just found some things that I was good at and I was in my early 20s and I was trying to figure out who I was. No existential crisis, it was just the next thing. And, and what I find is it's just a bad way to go about life. Is that a church planting or um, a relationship or any vocation or anything that you're gonna build your life on besides Jesus is going to at some level disappoint you. And beyond that disappoint you, it's gonna devastate you and eventually it's gonna destroy you from the inside out. And, and God is gracious enough to walk you through the joys and the pains of that. But when you think about this whole idea of being connected to church planting, and, and I was down the hill over yesterday, and, uh, and, and I worked closely with Matt Chandler, and yesterday we had a line of people at the end that were coming up, and a lot of people that were coming up telling us, you know, kind of telling Matt their life story. Uh, it's like, you got 30 seconds, boom, go. I mean, and so people were telling us about situations where, you know, I, I, I'm working in this church, and my lead pastor doesn't really want to pay attention to me, doesn't like the idea of me planting, blah, 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 blah. And, and the question that I think if we had more time we want to wrestle through is, okay, so let's just back up a little bit and talk about what's going on in your soul, and let's talk about how you're thinking about who you are. How do you see yourself in relationship to church planting? Are you getting involved in this because it, it's kind of becoming a thing? When, when I was here, I don't think I heard the word church planting a single time in the four years I was here at Beeson. Now it's just kind of out there. And so are you looking at this going, if I can do that, I'll be successful. If I can do that, I will have made it. If I can do that, then my life will matter. We live in a, in a day where the, the greatest fear, and I work with a lot of university students, our church is two blocks from the University of Georgia. There's a, there's a, there's a significant fear of being ordinary. Nobody wants to be ordinary. The great secret in church planting is that 99% of churches that we're going to start, nobody's going to know about in one generation. Can you handle that? Are, are you convinced enough that God loves you to just go do what God's called you to do, die and be forgotten? Is Jesus enough? So I think that element of if you're supposed to, be involved in church planning. That let's talk about you and, and who you are. The second question comes out of the word suppose, and it's the it's this idea of calling. I don't know how you construct calling, but in terms of me and how I think about calling, I don't I don't connect calling to a job. So I have two jobs right now. I'm the lead pastor of Christ Community Church in Athens, Georgia, and I'm the director of operations for a global church planning network. Neither of those are my calling. My calling kind of encompasses both. Here's how I think of calling. I think of calling as a combination of, of your skills, your wiring, and your passion. So part of that, and this is the opportunity why you're here at Beeson, is what are your skills? What are you good at? What do you do that adds value in the kingdom of God? Notice I didn't say church, because you might discover that your skills aren't necessarily as useful inside the church as they are outside the church. But the kingdom of God is bigger than the church. So what that means is, is that if you understand your skills and your calling may be bigger than what you feel like you're being trained for right now, what you're wiring, however you might develop it. There are so many different personality assessments and tools and things like that. So what's your Myers-Briggs, what's your DISC, all those kind of things. Is there enough self-awareness for you that you understand where you fit because the goal is that all work is hard but your best work is going to be work that you enjoy and that you're good at so i'm an intj a descriptor of intjs are mad scientists the best role for me in the universe is to sit in a room put a problem on the board and let me help fix it that's why i call myself the janitor in x29 because i just fix things it took me a while to be okay with that because, again, I was building an identity around the fact that I could communicate a little bit. I thought I was going to write. I was kind of going to be pastor. I was going to be well-known, but that's not who I am. Not only am I not that because of who I am in Christ, it's not my identity, but that, that's not even my wiring and my skills. INTJs, 
When you look at those list of vocations for an INTJ, you know what's not listed on there? Pastor. So, your skills, your wiring, and your personality, what are you passionate about? What's driving you to do this? What human need is driving you to be involved in what you're doing? Are you gripped by the glory of God and the spreading of the fame of Jesus? And so those three things coming together, skills, wiring, and passion, I, I think that those shape your calling. So when you get to this, uh, this idea of I'm supposed to be involved in church planting, it's connected to calling. It's connected to the, the skills that you have. It's connected to how you're wired in your personality. And there is no perfect personality. We, we see no correlation no one-to-one -one correlation between extroversion or introversion or D and I or anything like that on any assessment tool. There, there's not because the Holy Spirit uses different people in different ways. But it will lead you in certain directions. So are you supposed to be involved in church planning? So who are you? What's your identity? And, and then are, are you called to this? Do your skills, do your wiring, do your passions line up? The idea of, of being involved in planting something comes back to this question what have you built what have you started what have you developed church planting is is inevitably and inherently an entrepreneurial task so if you're not good with risk if you're not okay with being an early adopter if you're not okay with with trying new things if you're not okay with having big ideas and being able to follow through and execute on them if you've never done that well let's find some places for you to do that so we have men come in all the time and give us these great proposals on starting a new church. And my, my deal breaker question for them is, what have you started? So that youth ministry you're involved with, it was 50 when you got there and it was 60 when you left. Okay, that's, I mean, you didn't bottom it out. I mean, it didn't go from 50 to five, but what have you started and developed? And if you haven't, it's not that you're not called to do this. It just means that we have to, we have to build this thing out a little bit. We, we have to make it a little bit of a longer tail so we can see you build and develop something. I think that's one of the things that people don't understand or realize is that the idea of going in and starting something is so significantly different than walking into an existing organization. And it just takes a little bit different wiring and a little bit different um, ability to handle the tension that comes with change. And so if you're good with new things, if you're good with change, if you're good with starting things and having to pivot and, and do those kind of things, and, and we go this way and then we go this way and then we go that way, then I, I think that maybe that's a little bit of an opening into saying, yeah, maybe you are called to do this. Maybe this is a way for you to go. And then I think in terms of just called to planting a church, I would just say, what's your ecclesiology? What does that look like for you? When you define church, when you're thinking about that for you, for your family, what church you're going to be with, not just theologically, denominationally, uh, but even in terms of ministry, <laughs> philosophy, and methodology. What you, how, how are you wired? What is the church supposed to look like? Is it going to be this heavily attractional, come and see what God is doing in our lives? Is it going to be heavily incarnational? Let's go to people and let's, let's, let's be the hands and feet of Jesus so that, that there's reason for them to ask about the hope that's within us. So you're going to have to have this understanding of, of what, uh, what it looks like to be a church. So we ask men all the time, what is your plan to help people follow Jesus? What is your discipleship plan for your entire church? I, I can't get church planners and assessments to usually shut up. One of the two questions that does cause them to shut up is what's your discipleship plan? They don't have one. And so this is a great time while you are training to be whatever it is that God's calling you to be next, to consider what does it look like for you to be a follower of Jesus who makes other followers of Jesus? How are you going to be a disciple who makes disciples? And, and I think that's a non-negotiable for us. And then how are you going to develop leaders? And so uh, those are the four questions that I think for me, kind of a, a sort of a pre-assessment, who am I? And, and I think Ephesians is a great place to go in really wrestling through your identity of who are you in Christ? Um, and then I think this, the question of calling, and then the question of how am I wired in terms of de dealing with change and building things and what does that look like in my life and then what's going to be your doctrine of the church? What is the church in your world? And, and if you're coming out of a, a parachurch background, which I did, you're going to have to wrestle with that because parachurch is not church and you're going to have to know the distinction between the two and work through that. So 
Um, to me, it's really becoming more and more uh, the focus of, of my life. And what I enjoy more than anything is seeing uh, people succeed and thrive. What, what got me very excited about the event yesterday um, was not that it was my idea that, that, uh, that we had three years ago that happened yesterday, uh, but it was the potential in that room of seeing 700, 800 men and women who could be involved in the advancement of the kingdom by building churches for people who aren't going to go to the churches that exist right now. That's the fun part. There are people all across the city, and in some ways this still feels like my city because I lived here for 10 years and all of our family lives here except for me and my wife and my boys. There are people that I know and love and are friends and family that aren't going to go to the churches that are here. And so there's the opportunity in this city and in other cities and all around the world to see new expressions of the gospel of Jesus Christ lived out in community. Um, and so I, th I think it's a, certainly a noble calling. It's not the only calling. It's not, I tell people it's not about holiness. It's about calling. Going, uh, uh, going across the globe, going to some other culture, that's not a holiness. You're not more holy because you do that. It's hard everywhere. It's all about calling. So this is the opportunity to really wrestle through that. So you don't coast, don't simply hide behind the, the theoretical knowledge that you could get here, but take advantage of the opportunities to, to really develop who you are and, and what your real convictions are, because that's what's gonna drive you. I learned a lot of things here, some of which I still use. Um, and I, th I think the combination of the theoretical knowledge with the application in real time is significant. So it, it's, a, it's a great time um, for you to be here. So um, that's the biggest thing for me is I'd love for anybody and everybody here to be involved in church planning. But I think it's got to be you. It's got to fit you. So questions? I can, I'll start off with okay. one. I've got several. But um, <clears throat> say that the thing that most appeals to you about church planting is that you can do everything your way. Right. You can have the style of worship. You can have the liturgy sure. you've wanted. You right. can have all this. What would you <laughs> say to that person who maybe distrusts their own motives because it's really attractive to get to have your vision lived out? Right. So the question is, how, how do you wrestle with the tension of wanting to get involved in church planting because of the opportunity to do church differently. And the tension is usually between, I think it's a really good idea that I have to do church differently. There's some dissatisfaction with the status quo, but also a mistrust of my own heart because we read the Bible and it reminds us that we probably shouldn't always trust our hearts. Uh, so how do you wrestle with that? Well, I think one thing is, is you wrestle with that in community. Um, and I think there's, there's several elements to community. I think there's a peer element in, within community of people who have similar convictions to you and feel the same way that you do. I think there are also uh, some element of uh, people who are in an existing church. And I know for some of us that's a real tension because we're not able to have communication with maybe our supervisors or superiors in the church because they don't want us to leave or they don't like the idea of of us taking people from the church. But I think the more that you can have conversations with people who are affected by your decisions, and, and, and the, the effect of a church plant is, is for you, the people around you who go with you, the church that you may be a part of, and the broader church community. And so I think the more conversations you can have in community about that, the better. Uh, know that you're gonna have mixed motives. Uh, your, your pride and ego is gonna come into anything you do. And so there's gonna be some element that you're gonna be repenting of all of your good ideas. And that's okay. Honesty is going to compel you to go, this is for the glory of God and for the fame of my own name, both. And so being okay with that and being okay with repentance being a fairly regular thing in your life. And, and, and then I think continuing to see what's out there and in, in community with real honesty, uh, with yourself and with others and with God and then trusting God in everything, I think you move on that. So I think that's how you deal with anything in life, not just church planning. What do I do with the decisions that I need to make? Make those in community. Don't trust your own heart. Know that it's going to be mixed motives. So if they're mixed motives, it's not a deal breaker. If you know your own pride and ego is involved in it, it's not a deal breaker because your pride and ego is going to be involved in everything. So that, that would be the two things. In community, in a posture of repentance and faith. Some 
somewhat practical question I okay. guess, from your own experience. You've mentioned that you went to school here and like your wife's here, your family's here, but y'all planted in Aspen. Right. Um, so it's not like super far away, but it is different right. context in some way, shape, mm -hmm. or form. Did you know people in Athens that were no. connections? No. Okay, so so the, the, you go about that? the question is, is kind of, so if you're new to a, a place, how do you learn the context? And so. like just how do you go about the process? Right. How, how do you go about the process of being a good missionary? And, and you can apply it really anywhere, um, whether it's far away or close. Um, I, I, our story is this little church outside of Athens, Georgia, that had 35 men, women, cats, dogs, goldfish. They threw them all in to kind of boost the numbers. Okay. Um, we're looking for a pastor, and the head of the search committee had been a deacon at Harry Reader's church, who's the pastor of Briarwood Press, had, had been in their church in Charlotte. And uh, so he called Harry and said, hey, we're looking for a guy in his 50s. I don't age that well. Um, I was 28. So Harry's like, I think I got a 28-year-old guy that I think could be better for the, for the gig. And so he, um, he put me together with them, and so we didn't know anybody. And so we landed over there. My wife was six months pregnant with our oldest son and didn't know anybody. And, and I think the, the things we learned, and I'll say we learned largely through failure. Uh, most of them, anything I usually have good to say is because I usually screwed it up, so you're welcome. Um, I have to live with that, but you don't necessarily have to. I think take your time. Um, I, I would say spend time with people. Use the natural rhythms of life to build relationships. I find a lot of us that are in pastoral ministry uh, do prefer introversion, and so you're going to have to learn to leverage because you don't have a lot of uh, you don't have a lot of battery, right? So people wear you out. So take advantage of natural relationships. So I, I've got two men like right now. I've got um, a, a guy who's a fairly well-known sports writer that moved into Athens and. Um, moved from New York to Athens, Georgia because they have a two-year-old boy and he was pinging off the walls in their little New York City apartment so they moved him into my backyard practically so I was like well let's go hang out with the guy and see where he is with Jesus. I've liked his writing for more than a decade. It seemed natural to sit down and have a beer which isn't a problem for me and, and enjoy that time with him and get to know him a little bit. Uh, the guy who's the assistant coach of my five-year-old soccer team with me, I coach four and five-year-old soccer which is ridiculous that I do that. Um, but but I do, and so I'm having conversations with this guy. But it, so it's just it's just taking the time to get to know people, and and so I'd say cut some of your book study time. Um, it will help your sermon prep. Uh, it will help you get to know your context. Ask curious questions. Ask about people's story. Ask about why they moved here. Get together. Find the people who love your city, love your neighborhood, can tell the story of it, and learn it and just give yourself time. So if you're gonna go into a context, give yourself a year or two before you become the resident expert in your community. Um, because I, I see a lot of guys go in and think because they have a mindset for contextualization that they can figure out, oh, well, I'm in kind of this sort of urban section over here, so I get it, we got hipsters over here, so I know hipsters. Not necessarily. I mean, do you really think the story of, 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 of Avondale and what's going on over there is gonna be the same as what's going on in Soho? two completely different contexts. So just give yourself some time to learn how the unchanging, timeless gospel applies to, to the story and the rhythm and the assumptions of the people that live there. Because that's culture. Culture is at three different levels. Culture is on one level the things you can see. You go like that, there's the culture there. And, and then there are the things underneath that, kind of, kind of the, the, the behaviors that you can still observe but underneath that, the true heart of the culture, which is tougher to get to, are the assumptions. Because I can see the what, but I don't necessarily know the why. And, and, and I screwed up way too often by assuming the why. Assuming whys is a terrible way to approach uh, ministry and life in general. So ask the why. You see the what, go, okay, so why is that happening right there? So why is this the response in, in our community to this issue or that issue? How do most Acts 29 church planners support themselves? <laughs> Honestly, not well enough. So here's the, here's the other little secret is, is that I think church planners kind of take this bohemian approach. It's like, uh, we'll just start off and kind of scratch and claw and, and sort of struggle for a while, and then we'll be wildly successful and, 
and, and we'll have everything we need materially. We're also not a resource heavy network. It's not like NAM, and, and we're not a denomination. We're a catalytic network, and so funding isn't something that we really bring to the table. Um, so what I'm finding and, and advocating in a lot of ways in particular context for a season or long term is, is bivocational planting. Uh, I mean, uh, one, because it gets you around people that don't know Jesus. And it gives you the opportunity to do some of the contextualization stuff that, that you're not just going to get sitting in a coffee shop. I mean, you, you know, glued to your MacBook Air working on Logos 5 doesn't just magically allow you to learn the culture. And so having a job where you're working with people who don't know Jesus yet gives you a great context for that. And so, we, you know, we're trying to do a better job of setting men up well to, to care for themselves and their families and be able to thrive. And, and I find a lot of our guys just work in survival mode way too long. So I, I think you have to have that. We talk a lot about funding plans. And, and so, I, I, again, if you understand skills, wiring, and passion, that should be bigger than ministry. You have marketable skills. You're just going to have to pull them out and understand what they are. So a lot of people get into things and go, I don't have any skills because I'm in ministry. Well, that's a problem. There's something you do well. It may be research. It may be, you know, you, but you're going to have to take the time to be able to identify that. So if you can't rattle off five skills, five things that you're really good at that work out in the marketplace, figure it out. It's there. It's just like comedy. Comedians don't see stuff we don't see. They see the same thing we see. They just know how to interpret it. Your skills are there. You're just going to have to figure out how to interpret it and be able to understand it and be able to put it into practice. Yes, sir. Is there a most common job that Acts 29 church planners typically do by vocational? Is there a, a few different jobs that work really well on the by vocational side? I mean, our encouragement is... is um, Part of his life stage and situation, I, I honestly think church planting is becoming a 30-something, 40-something game, not a 20-something game. If you're in your 20s wanting to plant, we won't really talk to you unless you're 25 or over. And honestly, I don't really want to talk to you until you're 30. Um, because I think some, I think life experience, um, there's some life stage things that, that need to happen. Um, but I, I encourage guys to find something that's going to come with insurance. Be smart. UPS comes with insurance. Um, I see guys that, that want to be around situations where they're, they can engage relationally with people. So sort of a, you know, a job that has you in a cubicle where you never talk to somebody, maybe that's not a great thing. But again, I, I would just say more than just the in general job, work on your calling, your skills, wiring, and passion enough to know where it applies. We've got guys that are football coaches. We've got people who are um, working. We've got guys who are lawyers who are planting churches. Um, and so there's a fairly wide swath. And I, I actually think that if we're going to plant the number of churches that need to be planted, if we don't go by vocational, nobody's going to make it because there's not enough money. There's a lot of money out there. And if you're in a denomination, do both. You know, So we say we're catalytic. We, we, we want to be able to add value on top of what denominations and other groups are doing. And so if you're in a group that will fund you, and usually they're going to ask you to sign some kind of covenant, if you can handle the hooks that they're going to put into you, um, then take advantage of it. Don't get lazy with it, but take advantage of it. But I, I love the bivocational model, and essentially, even though my other job is working with church planners, it's what I'm doing. Yes, sir. I like what you said in the beginning about <clears throat> kind of the idea that a lot of people have of, of thinking there'll be an overnight success. And right. Kind of the idea that we're slaves to the hero story. And right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the stages of planting and how that grows? And I know you said you replanted your sure, church. Right. Can you talk a little bit about replanting right. the church and what some of the sure. issues were before and right. where you are now? So we'll, we'll take two questions. The first is kind of what's the staging in church planting and, and then talk about replanting. The, in terms of the stages of church planting, what we find... I think normatively, and what I would encourage people is not to think about planting the church, but plant the gospel in the lives of the people around you. So I want to know when a guy comes in and says, hey, I want to start a church. I'm like, well, I mean, who have you invested in around you, like your neighbors? Oh, we're half a step away from going, I want the names and numbers of your neighbors because we want to talk with them. Right? Because, I mean, it says that we, we should be well thought of by outsiders. 
that's a requirement to be an elder in the local church. And that would be the requirement for the family of leaders and all those kind of things. And so we'd want to know that. And so it, to me, it starts there. It starts at the very beginning of you're just trying to plant the gospel somewhere. And then you're beginning to develop other people around you, maybe in your neighborhood or beyond that, into what we would consider a core group. And and for us, you we don't really even, that that's sort of the goal. you got to develop your core group, get 40 adults and you know, the number is a little bit arbitrary, but you want to have some kind of critical mass that says this is beyond a small group or something like that. The, the, this is a community connected together to help follow Jesus and to help other people in our city follow Jesus. And then I think the developmental stage really just goes into um, when do you develop your own elders and become a church, in, which in my mind, churches have a plurality of elders. I know not everybody agrees with that. And so that's what we're looking for. I mean, that sort of particularization of being led, not by maybe another church, um, but on our own, freestanding. It's our guys. They're, they're leading the charge as elders, and, and we're fully funded. In most contexts, that's going to be the case. And so you just see those things. You get a core group. These are the people covenant together. I'm, a, I'm big on covenantal membership. I think it's a lost um, understanding and expectation. That's why I think there's so much church fluidity, because we don't understand covenant. We don't understand it in the context of marriage, and we don't understand it in terms of membership. That that same intensity of relationship that we see in, in marriage is the exact same thing that should be going on in the church. And so understanding that idea of covenantal membership, developing your own elders and deacons, uh, being able to support the work internally and then beyond to be generous to your city and the people around you those are kind of the stages that are involved there so covenant leaders being able to fund yourself in terms of replanting uh, the difference is the fact that you're walking into a group of people that have been together for a while um, the dna is fractured enough to where it, you don't just need to tweak it you're going to have to do some significant rewiring in some sense, you're going to have to gut the whole thing and start over. Some people shut it down for a season, a week or a month or longer, and then kind of come back with a new name, new branding, new identity. Um, I don't think you have to do that. We actually didn't do that. We just kind of uh, got the plane in the air and rebuilt it while we were flying. You can imagine that that was fun and catastrophic at times. Um, the One of the things that Harry Reader told me on the way out is... Um, the people that are already in your church are not scaffolding for your future church. And I heard that and failed that on some level, but I heard it and I remember it now. Replanting, you're not starting with brand new DNA, you're starting with an old DNA. Some of which was bad, which is why you have to replant the thing in the first place. So replanting requires a, a little bit more patience, which I didn't have, which is why it's funny that I replanted. Um, and it, it requires, I think, uh, a sort of a deafness of touch pastorally, which I didn't have that either. I mean, this is the funny story of our church. Broken down church, should have shut down everything I know about churches. Just should have shut down, said, hey, we had a good run at it. Let's high five, give hugs, go our separate ways, bless churches in the city. They didn't, they didn't shut down. And you bring in a 28 arrogant punk who had no reason and no heart to pastor people. I just thought everybody was ready to hear me preach. And God didn't blow us all up. That's, that's grace. And that's the mercy of God. And so replanting requires, should have, a real pastoral heart and a lot of patience wired with uh, a spine and, and an entrepreneurial vision for what this thing could be. And uh, I think there's a lot of need for it, and, and we're seeing a lot of it. So it's not, if you're going, I'm just not good at starting things. That may or may not mean that you're supposed to replant. Uh, I think in some ways you got to be a little bit tougher because you got hurt people. And broken people break things. And broken people break people. And broken people break pastors. So if you're not ready for people to be mad at you, even though they're not mad at you, it's not the right gig. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a simple question. It's probably somewhat naive. Um, do you have to feel a pastoral call to plant a church? Or do is, is that a prerequisite? Do you need to already know for sure right. that you're called to be a pastor before you plant a church? 
Well, the question is, do you need to feel uh, a sense of pastoral calling to plant a church? And, and my answer is going to be very helpful, yes and no. Um, yes, I mean, you know, you, you kind of walk in knowing. I, I would say no, because I think sometimes it surprises people. Uh, I don't, I, I think there are people who have a heart to see people follow Jesus and have a heart to see the gospel walk into a community that back into the fact that all of a sudden I need to start something new. And, and, and the Holy Spirit can blow up all of our categories. So everything I said about this wiring, that wiring, we see it. That's why we always have an exception clause to the way we do our assessments, and that's called the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit can take whatever we think should be there objectively in terms of our competencies and blow it up. We just think, we just see it rarely happens, but it can. And, and so for somebody coming along, and, and again, and, and the way I, I see when there's, within the broader calling of your skills, your wiring, your personality, when it's applied to a particular role, like pastoring a local church. I think that there's the internal confirmation of the Holy Spirit. There's the obvious understanding broadly of your skills, wiring, and passion, and then there's a group of people that want you to be involved in that. And I think if all those things are coming together, that's confirmation of God's calling on your life. But I, I, I don't know when the timeline is because at some point in time you have to have the conviction that you're supposed to be doing this or else you'll quit. divinity people that without a degree there's no need in trying to put yourself out there to become a leader or a spiritual guide or a pastor. Well, so in your eyesight that is not necessarily true. I think the caveat with that is the fact in, in a great book and it's, it's written by a guy that I appreciate a lot, may or may not be a follower of Jesus, is Seth Godin's Tribes. And if you haven't read it, you need to read it because it's basically Leadership 101, and that is there are people out there who need you to lead them. Now, that may be one person. That may be 1,000 people, maybe a million people. But the opportunity for you to find the people that, that God has connected you with to lead, that's, incre that, that's something that no degree can confer upon you. But here's the caveat. If you're going to go into a group that requires those credentials, well then, if you're going to be hooked up with that group, so in my denomination, you have to have a Master's of Divinity degree. You don't even get in the door. Do I think it's right? I actually don't. I think it's extra biblical and I think it's limiting because I, I tend to think that, particularly in, in a lot of ethnic and socioeconomic contexts, you can't do that. But in order to be in that group, you have to. And so, do you have to have those things in order to lead a group of people to pastor church? No, but it might not be in the particular group that you're a part of. The question is, what do you do with that? What do you do with that internally? And are you willing to take the risk to, to lead even if you don't have people behind you? And that's a risky thing, but you know what allows us to take risks? It's the Holy Spirit. And I find we get real challenged by that. And, um, and by the idea of trusting the Holy Spirit to actually guide us where we need to go. And we tend to lean on a lot of other things in that regard. So I'm in a network where our president, Matt Chandler, does not have, a, does not have an advanced theological degree, but he'll run circles around pretty much everybody here. Now, that's him. He's an exception. And, and I have a lot of young men come to me and go, well, well, Matt Chandler didn't get his degree. And I'm like, and you're not Matt Chandler. And, and so... I think that's, again, within the wiring of calling and the opportunities that are there for you and you listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, having people around you confirm that. And a lot of that confirmation comes from people who are with you, people who are around you, who are in other leadership contexts. And what's your take on female pastors? I'm convinced by the scriptures that there are two offices in the Bible, elder and deacon, and elder is the only one that's reserved for men. So that's where I'm coming from. And, and, and love my, um, my friends who are women who have different convictions of that. And, and I think if we can't have those differences um, and hold to that and still say, you know what, one of the, here's one of the things I've learned from being at Beeson and then working in Acts 29. When I was at Beeson, I, I, uh, I taught some preaching labs for Dr. Smith and had a woman who was in our, our lab who was training to be a PCUSA minister. And I think the first four weeks, all we showed were, were male preachers, and uh, were just men. And so she went to, to the doc and said, so why aren't there any women preachers? 
And he said, why don't you go talk to Matt? Because he knew where my convictions were. Now the gift of that to me was the awkwardness of having to have a conversation with a real life human being who was convinced from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet that God had called her to preach. So the opportunity to have a conversation that challenge and strengthen convictions, that's a gift. But what we have a hard time doing is, is, is living with that tension and being okay with that. I'm in a network that, that, that where people hold a different theological convictions than I do, and I wouldn't do church that way. I wouldn't approach things that way, but I see God work in different ways. So I think we can hold to our convictions with conviction and with humility understanding that God works in different ways and going, this is just where we are in the journey. I, I, could I be wrong? Could. I'm pretty sure I'm not wrong about Jesus, but I'm a Presbyterian. I could be wrong about baptism. I don't think I am, but if I get to heaven and God goes, hey man, you kind of missed it on, on baptism, sorry. So I, I would hope that we would just be able to handle that particular issue with a little bit more dexterity than I think we do right now. Acts 29, do people always come to you? Well, and, or do you strategically figure out where there need to be churches planted and then right. help plug people into those places? Like, do most people have an idea of where they want to plant? Online? Right. So the question is, in terms of planting, how do people get where, where they are supposed yeah. to go? I think it's a both and. I think historically we've been very reactionary. So people would come and go, hey, I want to go plant in Augusta, Georgia, or I want to go uh, plant over here in this part of Atlanta, or I want to go plant in... Sheffield, England, or I want to go plan in North Dakota, and, and we've just been like, okay, and we assess to that. I think we're trying to be a little bit more proactive uh, on two fronts. One is we're trying to develop more people inside our churches to be involved in church planting, and, and then I think we are looking at some strategic places and cities that we feel like are critical to the global advancement of the kingdom of God and trying to be there, like Miami's a, a big push for us, and, um, and, and there, are, there are cities that are like that. And the way that we're structured is it's a, we try to make it an actual network. So we try to push everything down and out. So people aren't reporting to me. I, I'm facilitating our regional network guys in, in North America and our continental directors around the world to build a church network. To go build a church planning network in your context. And, and so we're trying to encourage them to be pretty proactive in that and not just rely on, on people showing up. So you speak a little bit on like some of the, I guess, balances that you had to hold? I know Athens has kind of had a small wave of church planning downtown. There's four or five churches in the right. last like five years that have kind of yeah. taken off and are all great churches from right. the best that I can tell. And then like talking kind of on that relationship too of like right. targeting these cities where there are large church planting. Like what are some of the difficulties and positives of planting where a lot of planting is going? I think the, the question is, how, how, what do you do in cities? Let's just say this, every city in the American South, which has a lot of churches, why are we talking about planting churches, and how do you deal with the tension that are there? Well, I think that, that um, again, if we all understand that we do not have any special access into the mind and heart of the Trinity, then there's some humility that we approach all of this when we feel like we've got it mapped out. Like we know how this should work in the city, that you should be here and I should be there and you shouldn't be this close. So I, I think you have to be open to the Holy Spirit surprising you and putting a, a church next door to you. My question would be, what makes you distinct? And I find that there's a high degree in churches that there's just a high lack of clarity about, can you, so the vision mission thing that maybe y'all hear about, you need to have vision, you have mission. I find those confusing because people interchange them. So I ask these questions. Why do you exist? And then, and then how are you going to, how is the culture around you going to know you? What are you going to be known for? What do you do? Now, just go ahead and give you the cheat on that. Every church should answer the what we do question with some way that you're describing discipleship. That's what we do. We disciple. So in our church, we say, the thing we do is that we help people follow Jesus together as a family. So why do you exist? How are you going to behave? What do you do? How are you going to be successful? And then the vision question is where are you going? So we want to make it impossible for anyone in our city to ignore the real Jesus. That's our vision. Now think about what's embedded in that. 
words like impossibility, anyone, didn't say everyone, I said anyone, to ignore the real Jesus. Because everybody knows Jesus in Athens. Just not necessarily the real Jesus. The tension when you have churches pop up is, are you going to be about God's kingdom or your kingdom? That's the ultimate tension. And you can't manage God's kingdom. You'd like to manage yours. And we've chosen, externally at least, to always be a fan of the broader kingdom of God. Even as we internally wrestle with churches that I think struggle to communicate the heart of the scriptures. We don't play that game publicly. We handle our business. We tell our people all the time, this is our way of doing it. It's not the only way. Just look around. God's working in ways that we can't explain. And, um, and then having conversations. So I love sitting down with guys and talk about, so why are you here? What makes you different? And then depending on the relationship over time, being able to speak into that. Athens is fool's gold. It's a 150,000 person transient city. I have 40% turnover every year. 90% of our people won't be with us t- you know, 10 years from now. It's the way it works. And so people come in and they set up a church in a bar with no organizational clarity, just kind of running and going, and they don't last. I think for every five church plants in Athens, four of them don't last a year. We have some significant churches that have come along, and, uh, but I think they, just because they really fit the broader suburban culture so there's still not a church for downtown Athens. We've got an entire community of musicians, and we don't have a church there for them. It would kind of be fun to be that, but I'm not that guy. This is me. I'm polo and khakis increasingly. Athens, is that Georgia? Georgia, Athens? yes, ma'am. Georgia. Maybe one more question. Wrap it up. Yes, sir. Uh, just a question. Not necessarily about church planning per se, but also church revitalization, yeah. which is kind of on on the upward trend, kind mm-hmm. of maybe where church planning was on the whisper. Right. Um, when you're hearing how church revitalization is, um, is actually not moving that way. And uh, <clears throat> when you take kind of a core group from local church, kind of moving to revitalize the church, which is similar to church planning in a way. Uh, thoughts on that? A lot of it's you know the, the question is. Um, where is Acts 29 in relationship to church revitalization? I don't know that if we've come, well, I, I do know. We have not come down formally one way or the other. Um, we want to resource church planters and church planning churches. So a church that in the context of revitalization is wanting to be involved in church planting, which I think every church should on some level, then you know we're going to be actively involved in, in, and our member churches can be involved in that. now. There are lots of ways to partner with Acts 29. They may not be being a, a member of Acts 29. And so I, d- I don't see that as our calling and, and our work. Um, again, I'm, I'm good friends with guys that do that. And, and I do think that it's a significant opportunity. I think there's a lot that we're still learning about church revitalization. I find that church revitalization is similar to replanting and that you need a lot of patience. And I see a lot of men and women getting into church revitalization that are rather impatient. One of the best words from our conference yesterday was Ray Ortland, who's a friend of mine, um, basically said, you know, the real tension is, are we going to do the Lord's work in the Lord's strength in His way? Are we going to do the Lord's work in our strength, in our way? And I find there's a high degree of impatience because we're not, we're not, we don't want to deal with the mess that is right now. Well, it took 50 years for a church to get in this situation. Why do you think you're going to be able to change it in five weeks or five months? And, and, uh, and so I think that's the challenge, even though I think it's a great work, and, and I think we certainly need it alongside of church planning. I think it's a both and. I had the question yesterday, so why, if, why don't we just revitalize all of our churches? Because some are beyond revitalization. And because the rate of change means that there are people that don't know Jesus that aren't going to be able to to see that because you're in the middle of changing this thing. So let's do both. Let's not blow all the existing ones up. That's not the problem. That's not the issue. Um, But let's change it from the inside out. Which really, I mean, we were somewhere between replanting and revitalization. We never shut it down. So I can live in both worlds. So with replanters, I can say, I replanted. Revitalization, I'm like, I did that. So it's like baptism. I've been sprinkled and dunked. I don't know which one's right, but I'm good either way. So that's great. 
Well, uh, I'll stick around and, and answer any other questions you have, but uh, I'd just love to pray for you and, uh, and then just kind of have you go about your day. And thanks for spending an hour uh, with us. Father, thanks for your grace and, and mercy to us. Uh, really, your mercies are new today. And, and I pray uh, for these men and women who are here and, uh, and for whatever's going on in their world. Uh, I pray that uh, even now you convince them uh, that you love them, that, that there would be an experience of the felt love of Jesus in their life. Uh, you can just walk through their story. And in the midst of, uh, of all the pains that are in all of our lives, there's, there's this, this consistent rhythm of grace and mercy towards us. And thank you for the privilege of being able to sit in this room and to be able to have this conversation and to be able to think and, and dream and process a little bit about what you're doing in our life. Here's what we know, regardless of what happens in the future, you've always been faithful. Uh, you've never abandoned us, and, and you never will because of Jesus, and we pray through him. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate you coming out.